I'm mostly interested in uh, uh, creating a world that is like our world, but this is fiction, so some things have to be different. So for me, uh, or already, this is uh, fantasy in the sense that it's another world. Um, as to what is science fiction in, in general, or fantasy in general, there are so many uh, different ways of uh, describing like uh, high fantasy and low fantasy, uh, I wouldn't go into that. Uh, I just say that I'm mostly interested in the low kind of fantasy, where uh, the, the physical laws are almost close to ours, with one difference, for example. So um, when I was writing the fantasy trilogy with Simon. Um, the Fiddin trilogy, I used to explain that it's like walking in, in, a, in a street in Malta and then you turn around the corner and suddenly it's not the same reality. So this is the kind of uh, fantasy that I'm interested in. Uh, in Rocket it's, it's different uh, because there is uh, time travel, but I don't think I... I, I didn't set out to write a, a time travel kind of fantasy, it just happened because it's a very important element in the plot, but I will be talking about this later. Okay, this is actually a really difficult question. Mm -hmm. I've tried to come up with a coherent answer and I don't think there is one. Um, I think science fiction is what we say science fiction is. I think it's what we say science fiction is as writers and I think it's what we say science fiction is as readers. Um, a division between science fiction and fantasy, you can see some obvious ones, but equally things slide over and you, there was at one point something called science fantasy, which was for people who couldn't actually make up their mind which of those two. I, 
don't think there is one. I think it's a sensibility. I think it's a state of mind. I think it's a way of approaching fiction. I think we look at the world in the way we look at it. Is science fictional or fantastic or not? And so some of the really great books that I consider fantasy, like Bulgakov's Last from Margarita, lots of people consider straight literary novels. Um, Margaret Atwood's another one is she science fiction, is she not science fiction? I mean, she obviously is, but equally, she's also obviously literary. At what point does something become so successful in the literary field that it then stops being science fiction and becomes a serious novel? Um, they're good questions, but I don't actually spend a lot of time thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. Um... I think labels are for jam makers. I uh, don't like the idea of being put in a box because then you only get to use what's inside that box. So if I want to write a story that has robots and science fiction and machines that open doorways to other worlds, but I also want to have dragons, then I'm going to do it because that's what I want to do. And I don't like being told that I can only have one thing. And I think you hit on something very important there where when, you're, when you become a writer, when you tell people you write science fiction or fantasy, they go, oh, and would you not think about writing real books? And you're like, <laughs> you know, bite the top of their face off. Um, and uh, there, is, there is a tendency to uh, say, you know, wow, that book was so good, I could forget it was science fiction and think it was literary. And that's just not, I just don't like that at all. And I think that um, the only genre is quality. And I think that um, if you want to, I like breaking down genres to their kind of, their recognisable elements. So when you think of a Western, you don't have to think of cowboy hats and horses. You can think about frontierism and uh, being on your own and creating a law where there was no law, or you can, it's colonialism and all that kind of stuff there. So you can cherry pick and choose what you want and build your own genre. Dave, I'm a genre. That's what I decided. <laughs> this idea of lightsaber, um, this idea of sort of reverse snobism and literary fiction, something we will touch upon later. Um, you mentioned sort of setting out to create your own words. How do you approach sort of world building and making it distinct, like? If I'm reading a novel, okay, but no, it's not a it's a novel, it's Kelly's, Jones, or Dave's. How sort of, like, do you establish your own rules with them, then break them? <laughs> I mean, this is not a satisfactory answer, but I just make things up as I go along. <laughs> um, I love describing things. So if someone's reading a book and there's a lot of description about, like, the weather and the atmosphere and the, you know, like gloomy feel to it, it's probably mine. But um, I think a lot of it is is that a big part of the draw of writing it is that I want to like feel this place. And sometimes that place fits into the real world. Sometimes it is completely fantastical. Sometimes it is a spaceship. And um, like I'm not thinking, oh, I'm going to write a you know a particular genre, but it is a particular setting, and I love creating those settings. And then wanting to make it feel real to a reader because when I'm reading, like that's what I love is somebody taking me out of me sitting, you know, on my sofa with my cat and putting me in a magical city or, you know, through a portal or wherever. Um, so I think a lot of it is when I'm sitting down to write is I want to make it feel real, whatever story it's going to be, whatever happens in the story because within sci-fi fantasy all the huge range that, that there can be adventures, there can be mysteries, there can be romances, there can be spy thrillers, there can be heist stories, and those can all fall into, you know, science fiction, science fictional and fantastical worlds. So it's like the story and then put it somewhere interesting. So that's how I go about it. <laughs> uh, I usually start with characters. So I, uh, before I even know what kind of story is going to be, what genre, when it's happening, before I know any of this. Um, I'm just focusing on characters. It's like I'm, I'm in a place and I'm, I'm meeting the new people there and I'm getting to know them and I get to see um, who are they, what is their story. 
their history, what are they thinking of, and how would they react in different situations. And after that, I start putting them in creating situations for them. And I like to give them difficult situations just to see how they react. Like it's, I, I give them problems. I, I, I put them in a difficult position and I examine, I, I see, I watch, uh, I watch them trying, struggling to get out of the situation. And then I start zooming out. So I, I really start from the character and I start zooming out and I start noticing where they are, um, with who they are, who, who, is, uh, who are the other characters in their story, uh, the location. Um, and then obviously this leads to the time, when is this happening? So obviously it's, um, this is my way of building the world, starting from the character, moving out, and then uh, I'm getting more information about this bigger world, which in turn is going to affect them in a certain way. So that's usually that's the way I work. I think the best description of giving your characters problems was something an editor said to me, which is chase your characters up a tree, throw rocks at them. <laughs> when they're completely exhausted, throw bigger rocks at them. <laughs> then let them work out how to come down again. And it's always seen, it's always been really simple. I begin with a single image, and I don't know where in the book the single image is, and I don't actually know who's in the image. But with the very first book I wrote, there was a woman standing at the top of stairs by the Seine in Paris, about to go down, and there was a police car behind her. And in the course of writing that scene, um, she was going down to examine the body. The body at the bottom was hideously mutated. The police car at the back turned into a hovercraft. Um, there was a poster of Napoleon XIV or something on the <laughs> wall, and I realized that actually it had to be science fiction because it wasn't the crime fiction I thought I was writing when I set out to write it. Um, having had the image, I work forward and I work backwards. I work backwards to where it should begin and forwards to where it needs to end and then begin to fit the things around. And it's for me a bit like building a house. You put in some foundations, then you put up some walls, and then you put in some fittings. And the first draft of the first Arabesque book, which was Pashazad, which is set in an alternate North Africa around the current period. I got to the end of the first draft and there was a murder and I still didn't know who had committed the murder. And I didn't work out who had committed the murder until the second draft. And so in, in a sense that with the images you have someone on a bench and they're crying and then in the second draft you know what they're saying when they're on the bench and they're crying. And then in the third draft, you know why they're on the bench, and why they're crying, what they're saying, and what the implications of their crying and what they're saying are. And that's how I construct novels. Um, I write books out of spite. Uh, I write books as a form of revenge on ideas I don't like. Um, <laughs> and I think the the reason that I love writing fantasy is because you can design an entire world and an entire system of magic around what a character needs to learn, like as, as you were saying earlier. So in Knights of the Bar of Dark, in my first novel, my main character has grown up reading um, all the books where a kid gets magic and he has watched every single horror film where somebody says, you know, who's there? And someone's like, the murderer. And it's like, <laughs> and she is very, very sharp. And he sort of talked himself out of having hope. Um, and he sort of, he knows what a main character looks like in a book and he's not, he isn't one. And he ends up joining an organization who the more they use their power, the more it turns them to iron because I hate books where characters are automatically brave. I want bravery to have a cost. And the longer a night of the Bar of Dark works, the less human they become because fighting a war for a very long time changes you. And that was my sort of starting point where I wanted to, uh, 
it sounds weird talking about realism when you're writing a book about magic, but I wanted there to be real consequences. I don't think um, I don't. I think you can build a really amazing fantasy world, but unless it has a real tangible effect on the people, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and so that was my sort of starting point. And as and as you said, over drafts and drafts and drafts you hone that vision and you polish it and you snip off all the bits or the characters that don't work and eventually it kind of looks like you knew what you were doing all along (laughs) but you didn't Um, so yeah from this idea of uh, world building how important is the landscape and what you write because for instance in the memory trees the grove is as much a character in itself Malta and Rocket and the Fitting Trilogy so it's very distinct. Venice is quite literally a character in its own right, and the Assassin's Trilogy and Ireland. Like, I remember when reading Bands of the Ball of Guard, the first thing I did do was, like, okay, go on Google Maps and see you from where Crosscaper or Ninjas to Dublin and see how long it took the characters to arrive there. So, how do you sort of go about and start the influences to draw from? Landscape itself. I um, I love inventing settings, even if it's real. You're inventing it. Like you have to make people believe it, even if it's a real place. Um, which is the problem with so many books at New York City. They're read and published by people who live there, so they don't bother to make it feel real. But that's an aside. <laughs> um, but for me, um, I like I have a background. I'm have uh, degrees in geology and physics, so like the physical world and like the natural world, the geography of the world has always been a part of my life. And so when I'm writing, it's just natural for me to create actual physical landscapes. And when you create like an actual physical landscape, the rest of the world sort of like follows along from that because like for my um, one like pure fantasy book, City of Islands, is a city of islands, <laughs> and it is an isolated like archipelago in the ocean. That's a big, big training center and everything. And like I started with just this image of these cities that are shrouded with fog, with ships coming in and out. Then I was like, well, what kind of like culture would that have? What kind of people would live there? What kind of population would it have? So it um, it grew just from me loving the idea of you know. Like John mentioned, like starting with a vivid image for me, it was a vivid image of, you know, like a small boat on the water surrounded by fog, and building that. And then I just sort of wanted to make it feel real, so I was like, okay, how do you build that? Um, so it is a lot of thinking about, you know, setting and landscapes, and even when it's completely artificial, because I've written Salvation Day, it takes place entirely on a spaceship, so there's no actual landscape there, but there's still story landscape. Yeah, like the spaceship is a character. So right. Like it's, sort of it's, it, it's a very like claustrophobic landscape. It has very hard limits. And so it's, I mean, a lot of it I think is just thinking, for me, finding something that I find really cool and then figuring out what that would actually be like to be in. Because that's what landscape really is. It's a place for people to exist. <laughs> I have a tendency to um, be very precise and accurate uh, with the with the place I'm working in, um, where my characters are. I want to know exactly where they are, and usually I stick to the to the to an actual map. So I am I am plotting their movements on a on a map that is, it's very, it has to be very clear for me, because uh, at the point where they go down the rabbit hole, literally I have this tendency to, to throw my characters uh, in some labyrinth underground. Um, when I make that switch from reality to fantasy, uh, I have to be, uh, it has to be very clear for me that switch, you know, that this was real and now this is no longer real, as in this is what happens in everyday life and uh, this is when suddenly things uh, are not quite right anymore. So usually I'm working with uh, with maps and uh, 
Google Maps and I'm checking <laughs> everything. Uh, with, with Rocket, for example, um, there, uh, in the first part, there's a lot of traveling around Europe uh, in cities where I, I wasn't, I, I've never been there. So I was imagining a lot of stuff. And then, um, then coming to Malta, when the character comes to Malta, I wanted to create a, a fictitious small that this was set in the future. It's 50 years from now, so I tried to imagine how Malta would look, what changes would it have undergone in 50 years. If things were to keep going as they are now, what can happen, what could happen? So to create that fictitious um, map of Malta, um, with, with huge changes, like uh, this uh, division, for example, the, um, or rather, the, the way that the island, which is a small island, it's becoming smaller because of climate change, and uh, um, the, the, the sea, is, uh, the level of the sea is going up. So I was, uh, that is where the, the fantasy element comes in for me, that I, I, I am sort of, it's like a, superimposition of the fantasy on top of the real, but it has to be accurate. So I was really uh, studying the maps. Okay. And uh, I don't live in Malta, so whenever I come to Malta, I uh, drive around a lot and take notes to see like how it looks and how it would look in 50 years time, with all the big changes that I am making my characters go through. So. I think yes to all of that. Um, I could just pass on now. I mean, I am obsessed with maps. When I did the arabesque books, I bought First World War, I bought pre-First World War maps of Alexandria. And I went through and crossed out all of the street names that related to particular events. And I then pushed everything forward about 60 years, looked at the city, what it would look like, changed a number of street names, and left a number of street names the same, but had it so that you could steer your way across Alessandria from one side to the other using the book, simply by, because everything in it would be accurate. And when I did the Assassini books, I bought a six, early 16th century map of Venice, and I used that exclusively for all the scenes, because I knew everything would be accurate at that point. And I tend to go to the places I write about. I make a lot of notes, and I used to sketch, now I just use my iPhone photograph. <laughs> but I used to do sketches of streets all the way down the street with what the shot was like. So if you walked down that street, and you looked that way or that way, you would have the right shots. And for one of the books, Stamping butterflies. Set in Marrakesh, I made three trips to Marrakesh. And between my second and third trip, someone built a wall across the street, which meant that a shot somebody takes was impossible. So I had to tell the publisher I was going to need more time because I would need to completely <laughs> rewrite that section. Um, my answer is going to be much less fancy than that. Um, I. Uh, I'm from a very small village in, in Ireland. There are more people in this room than there are in the village where I'm from. Uh, that is not a joke. Uh, and as a small and lonely and odd child, I used to uh, go for kind of long walks to the, to, the, to the country and I became very obsessed with a particular uh, thin, narrow road with like the grass in the middle where the trees just kind of closed over and there was a patch of darkness on the ground about maybe two meters uh, across and I would become terrified every time I had to walk across it but also I couldn't stop walking across it um, and uh, that sort of intersection between the real and something unreal or something scary I think is what being a kid is all about and uh, I really wanted to set my book in Ireland because when I was growing up everything was set in England 
and everything was set in America. And I, uh, I also grew up just below the border from Northern Ireland. So whenever we would visit my grandmother, you know, you would drive up to the, the, the border fort and you would get out of the car and the nice men with the large guns would search your car and then would send you on. And that was a huge inspiration for, even just for the knights themselves, because they're not heroes fulfilling a prophecy or there, there's no talk about winning the war they have between themselves and their enemies. They're just border guards. They're just people who stand here and they kind of have no interest in learning about what's on the other side because they're too busy defending against it and that's sort of really got into my head and also it's easier to describe stuff when you live there <laughs> so well. I can just look out my window and go that's what Dublin looks like cool um, but yeah so again not as fancy I think it's easier to describe things I think it's easier to describe things when you um, just get to make it up <laughs> yeah yeah that is, that is, <laughs> my, my the third night's book is set in a different city that is a, a fictional city and I find it much harder because I had to start, I had to try and design a city in my head as opposed to just going, that one, <laughs> so, as you know. And then, um, to what extent, sort of going on from the uh, things you mentioned about searching your cars, etc., do, does political stuff, something which is happening now, something which is happening in the past, influence seep into your work, sort of the current angst of our time, because as, were, uh, as I mentioned earlier before, this conference, um, for instance, let's say um, during the nuclear arms race, um, we had comic books dealing with superheroes, which exhibited sort of, sort of this worry, worrying about something which was barely understood at the time. So, how does this sort of translate into your own work? Um, for me, um, it is more and more, more and more I find myself deliberately like dealing with these big political themes because it's so like, impossible to ignore. You know, it's, it's everywhere and it's frightening and the world is a place with many, many problems. Um, I didn't start out doing that on purpose, but it just kind of kept creeping in and as I noticed it, I was like, oh, okay, I'll embrace it on um, my next book which is probably going to be out sometime next year, is basically about how capitalism is evil. <laughs> it's like, you know what? I'm just going to lean into that and write it <laughs> and hope somebody gives me money for it, which is ironic. <laughs> I know, but <laughs> you know. Um, it's one of those things where I think um, it's important to still, you know, none of this, none of the setting, none of the genre, none of the political, anything matters if the characters aren't there. So it still always has to come back to writing about characters who are real. But I think it's also okay to be aware of the fact that the readers who are actually real live in a world where they are surrounded by the you know 24 hour news cycle of impending catastrophe all the time. And so um, like it's okay to like embrace that. I don't think it makes you preachy. I don't think it makes you moralistic. I think it just makes you a person with something to say about the world and the way people live in the world. Yeah, how that more is sort of one of the central themes in salvation and this yes. ongoing idea of immigration. Yes, I live in um, Southern California, right on the border between the United States and Mexico, where there is a huge, um, I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I don't need, I mean, I think it's what my the United States government is doing is an atrocity beyond words. And the thing is, is like where I live, it's a very safe place, but you see people in the news being like, oh, there's migrants coming over the park. No, it's the, the yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody who's aware of the situation is, and so the way people treat um, refugees and marginalized people and like um, people who make decisions just for a better life that sometimes put themselves and other people in danger or not, you know, it could be, you know, just so much is just chance and luck and all that stuff, um, became a huge part of when I was writing Salvation Day because it was everywhere and I realized that it fit in with the story that I was telling and actually it was one of those things as um, mentioning the book changes as you revise your eyes, I was talking to my editor about it and she was like, like don't don't hold back, just you know, go ahead and deal with it. And um, 
God randomly preaching. I'm like, it wasn't random. I was doing that on purpose. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like the yeah. intention was us from the start. Yes. To to yes, it's very deliberate. Um, it the way you treat yeah. vulnerable people says says a lot about the civilization that you are creating. And this is a book set in the future, and you know, supposedly derived from our world. So that is very specific commentary on the choices that societies make on how they treat marginalized and vulnerable people. I never like to watch the news, but at <laughs> home my, my parents were used to watch the news in Maltese, in Italian, on the radio, so all day, and I used to switch off. Uh, not not the radio, but uh, mentally I used to switch off and uh, read my books, uh, live live my own stories in my head. But obviously, um, information used to seep in, nonetheless. So this is how I uh, sort of uh, understood the world as I was growing up. Like my my fantasy stories and uh, bits of reality here and there what's happening uh, in the political world out there. And I think this is uh, something that um, I kept doing even in my writing. Um, I still don't watch the news, but it watches me because it's uh, everywhere. Uh, I cannot avoid it. Um, and I, I had decided that I don't want to write um, political. Uh, I don't want to write anything overtly political, so I don't want to. Um, I, I, I don't. I'm, I'm not. A, uh, I'm not interested in protesting loudly against things that I don't agree with, but I still protest in my own way, and this uh, this is something that I do in the stories that I write. Um, for example, for if the uh, someone reading Rocket would notice uh, things that I have uh, just uh, mentioned in passing, and it, they are—they have a strong political relevance. For example, the fact that 50 years from now um, the island is getting evacuated, and it's the Maltese who have to run away from the island, seeking shelter somewhere else. So. Uh, with this, uh, with, the, with the question of refugees, and I, I, I try to turn it upside down and say, what if it's the other way around? Um, also, with with uh, the problems like climate change, it, Rocket has been described as eco-fiction. I didn't even know that the term <laughs> existed. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and apparently, even the previous novel is eco fiction, and I hadn't, uh, I, I wasn't aware of that. So, um, so it's there, it's all there, it's in the background. What, what, I, what I, I don't agree with in, uh, in the way things are going, the way things are happening in the world, it will come out in some way or another. So, but I will not do it in a straightforward way, so it's not going, that's not my style. But uh, there will be some kind of comment, or if anyone wants to read between the lines, it will be there. Yeah, but there's also the sort of ongoing query about the siege mentality of America of and how what is being occupied at the moment. Yes. The yes, obviously um, there was a very specific reason why I chose 2064 as the year where the novel starts because that is uh, 100 years after, that would be 100 years after we achieved independence and I wanted to make a comment like what if just because now we are uh, we, we are free, we are autonomous, independent. What if things change? Because we have a tendency to, to take things for granted. So I wanted to to play with that idea. And then in 2064, we're no longer, um, we, we are again um, an occupied country. So 
that's uh, like the, the future. I am interested in a future which looks more like the past. Uh, am I? So my, my, my image of the future was never this kind of glittery, perfect place. Uh, you know, so it, uh, it's always like, uh, I, I do believe in um, history repeating itself in a different way, but it, it, it tends to repeat itself. So this, we, we tend to repeat the same mistakes. And uh, I think it's also a political statement. <laughs> so always it's like sort of standing between two mirrors and having like an endless sequence of events. To a certain extent, yes. Um, this came because I, once I noticed that there is a tendency of, uh, for um, children to connect more with their grandparents, and the misfit is the one in the middle, the parent. You know? It's because um, children tend to uh, go against their parents' wishes, and then when they grow up, their children will go against them, so it will end up uh, grandchildren and grandparents uh, would mirror each other. So it be, why? Because we uh, are always doing this. No? We are. We want to change the present, and then when we change it, time has passed, and then we want to change it again, and then we probably change it back to how it was before, which is why this cycle of repetition. In rocket, it's all about that. Which means that my generation faces the terrible choice that their children might be conservatives. <laughs> <laughs> they all face the terrible choice that their children will be socialists. So all will be fine in the end. <laughs> no, I mean I think because we live in this point where society is about to change, history is about to change, and the people going through it don't know that there's going to be an absolute cliff and everybody's going to drop. So whether it's change from medieval to Renaissance, whether it's the French, the years before the French Revolution with the last banquet, whether it's the fall of the Berlin Wall for people within East Germany and Moscow and Russia, the Soviet Union, which is what I'm writing at the moment. I'm doing a sequence of three books for Penguin and they're in the run-up to the Berlin Wall, and your characters know nothing of what's going to happen, and the reader knows exactly what's going to happen. And I think, at the moment, I feel quite strongly that we're the reader, and we have no idea what's going to happen. That's really interesting, uh, kind of on-the-brink on fiction. Like, um, and I think that kind of ties into, um, I, I agree with everything you guys are saying, that uh, like politics of the sea that we live in, and you can't escape that. I wasn't particularly political as a four-year-old, but I still had to get out of the car when the nice man with the gun asked me to. Um, and my first trilogy is for 11 to 13-year-olds, and what interests me about that age group is that that's the moment when you start to sort of understand the wider world of, or you start to notice, I guess, the wider world of politics. I think if anything kind of typifies middle grade fiction, it's um, realising that you are a separate entity from your parents and your family and you may have to face consequences that are separate from your parents and your family. And I think it's really interesting to try and, not that I try and introduce themes of politics into, into my work for kids, but my main character is drafted into an organisation that has its own politics and has politics connected to the rest of the world and has to learn these because they're going to affect him. Um, I think a great thing about writing for young people is the second you start to preach the second it starts, starts to sound like school, they will just shut off. And so you have to, I mean, we've been using stories to inform people of beliefs for a million years, so you can do that. But the second you say, this is I, the writer, and what I think, they will just get annoyed or bored. Um, and I'm also, like, I'm quite resistant to things that people call politics, but I don't think are politics. So my book has a diverse cast and I've been like I've had people say, you know, oh, it's it's political. It's like it's not political to include people of color or gay people or trans people. They exist, you know. It's like like you have to be very specific to try and ignore them. If you like, if you're writing a book where they don't exist, you are lying. Um, and uh, I was in a I was speaking in a school recently, and um, 
the principal come down to talk to me before I did my event, which doesn't really happen because uh, they're busy and I'm in Egypt. Um, and uh, I was like, oh, I'm looking forward to, to speaking. And she was like, we've had a complaint. And I was like, I haven't started yet. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's probably good to get them in now. Um, and they said, no, um, a parent is worried because you have a, uh, she's worried you have a trans character in your third book. And I was like, right, well, they, like, they don't come up in the talk and what's the problem? She's, like, She's just worried you have some sort of agenda. And I was like, I don't have a big machine I'm going to put all the kids into and make them into trans. Like, that's like, like I, and, she, and the, luckily the principal was like, I told her with respect, she can either take her kid out or stop complaining, that's fine. Um, but it was just so strange that that somehow counts as like a political agenda. It's like, it's not, I'm just... It's, 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 realist, it's more realistic than the monsters in my book, having people of different ethnicities or whatever. So I don't like that, like, what some people call politics isn't politics. It's just normal. It's just showing the world as it is, I, I think guess. almost, um, because I've written for children and teens too, and I think you get that a lot more when you write people being aware of that. But I think um, I agree that, like, you know, adding characters who are diverse is... I mean, I think it is a political act, but I think it's more about removing a political assumption of that everybody has to be like a straight white boy, yeah. which is, you know, like literature was never really that, but I think there's still a feeling that like that's the default and that everything else is a political choice rather than like what's real is like that was a political choice. That was yeah. a choice to make literature look a certain way and or like more specifically, the literature that is you know, promoted and given awards and handed to children to learn in school, because there's always been diverse writers. Yeah, they just don't always get the support and the you know readership. But I do I think about that a lot because you know, when you go to schools, talk to kids, and at this festival, there's 10 million children running around. <laughs> <laughs> at least that's what it looked like when I was there. Like um, like kids expect the book to look like their classroom. And their classroom is going to have, you know, children who are families of refugees, children who have, you know, who are not straight or have queer parents, and children of different religions, children who, you know, are raised in very, like, liberal backgrounds and children raised in very oppressive backgrounds altogether. And they expect to see you know, their friends and their world, and that includes the world that they know from online. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, I think, much bigger than a world that a lot of their parents and teachers <laughs> want to admit. So, um, like, just adding, you know, just agreeing with that, like, that is, I think it is a political, like, issue only because people have pushed against it. We're and correcting a previous yeah, yeah. yeah, correcting something that was a, you know, Sometimes deliberate, like especially in science fiction, since that's what we're talking about here, um, a lot of female writers in science fiction were deliberately erased, like from the, and, and a lot of um, writers of color too, wrote, were very successful, and then were just removed from like anthologies and stuff because the people who were making those lists didn't want them there. And those people were making a political choice. So now to push against that is like, no, 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 we're, we're fixing your mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> and you do that with the characters that you write about, with the stories that you tell, and also with the, the writers that you so support and read. <laughs> so. And uh, going on from this, how much, uh, where do you achieve the balance between telling a story and conveying a message? And of course, there's this, this, uh, there's this sort of backlash. Okay, you're, you're becoming political. And all you're doing actually is just sort of redressing an uh, imbalance. Um, I'm talking a lot, but I don't actually think you need to balance that as the writer. Like, I think you just need to tell your story the best that you tell it, and you can't control the way people react to it. Um, and if people react like badly because you have a trans character, for example, that is, I mean, you made an impact on them, you told your story. So I think it's um, tell your story as honestly as you can, and that's going to be informed by everything you know, that you believe and that you think about the world. And 
you can't control how people react to it, and you sort of have to, you know, you know, say your piece. But yeah. you're just, I mean, we're storytellers. We want to make people think, but we also want to entertain them. So you want to do it the best you can, and then, you know, hope that it impacts people. And if they hate it, you're still having an impact on them. Yeah, <laughs> which I know it's preferable in a way to a uniform response. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I feel like reader responses. It depends on. <laughs> it's the it's such a crapshoot. <laughs> like you can't really predict how people are gonna read a book, and all you can do is try to write it the best you can and say what you want to say. And oftentimes, that it, I mean, for the most part, that isn't like a message. That is like I want to tell a story about these people stuck up a tree with rocks being thrown at them. <laughs> and make it feel as real and interesting as possible. And the rest of it, I think, just comes in. Like, it's, it's part of the tree that they're stuck up. That's a terrible metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite reader review I've ever gotten um, is uh, on, and I don't, Goodreads is for readers, not for authors, so I've stopped going to it. And they should be, you shouldn't ever read your own reviews because it's not, they, they don't think you're reading them, so they're gonna be honest and it's, not that it's your fault if you're upset by it, but whatever. Um, but there's a review of Knights of the Bar Dark. It's like, I didn't like this book. But then again, I don't like kids' books or fantasy books. Oh, yeah. And I was like, <laughs> then why did you? <laughs> it's like reviewing, going like, you know, I didn't like this book, but I was looking for a cookbook. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. It's like... Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask you about the reader will... will react to my writing that much in the sense that I focus mostly on writing it and then how I feel uh, about reading my own work and I stop there because I then it's it's not uh, it's not up to me anymore how the how the reader will read I mean the reading process is is very it's an individual Experience and I'm I'm not really part of it, so I don't I don't think about that much. I think I tend to agree. I mean, you're always going to offend somebody at some point with something, and there was a time when they when they'd write to you, you know, online to paper and bring in, and you get one. Now, of course, the internet exists and email exists and they can get all their friends to write to you at the same time. So you can't worry about offending people equally. You can't, I don't write for a particular group. I just write and then hope someone likes it. I mean, there's a huge arrogance in writing an email because you're putting down your thoughts, you're putting down the inside of your head, you're putting down your vision of the world, hoping that there are people who are going to put down money actually read this, which is so absurdly arrogant that I don't think you can actually worry about anything else. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. It's such a, and I think it's very hard being a writer because you have to balance, on one side, you need to have a lot of uh, arrogance to think that your story deserves to be on the shelf with all of the other proper books. But on the other side, you need to have a lot of self-doubt because you need to look at each sentence and go, mm, that's not good enough, I need to tweak it. And so you're balancing, like, some days I'll be like, I'm a genius, this is the best. And then other days I'm like, I'm so useless, I'm terrible. So it's just, just, it's a seesaw. I think there's also an element of, by the time your book comes out, you've been over it so many times, and you're like, I don't care what readers think, just yeah. don't talk to me about it anymore. <laughs> don't it's think done, it's finished. <laughs> when you read it later, Okay, so now we'll sort of address the ongoing issue about genre fiction and literary fiction, something which I'm kind of still unsure about, like whether it's a fruitless exercise or whether it actually had, has its benefits in a way. So, okay, as I said, when really, uh, they start sort of obsessing with pigeonholing stuff, with labeling things, everything has to fit. Even within the world of metal music, like, okay, this set, what, what kind of music is this? Is it really important? 
black metal and death metal. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, um, Grindcore. I, I, um, I think as a writer, it's not important at all. But I think um, it's useful as a category for letting readers find what they want to find. I think of this as similarly um, the difference between children's, middle grade, young adult, adult. It's like, well, you could have any kind of story in any of those categories with different, you know, characters and everything. But like the reason you call something, say, middle grade, is some kids who are eight to twelve years old can find books that will hopefully appeal to them. And I think it's sort of the same thing. You call something science fiction when you put it out into the world or your publisher decides to call it that or reviewers decide to call it that. So people who like things that have previously been labeled science fiction can like it. But I think, um, and I say this as somebody who's written a book that takes place entirely in a spaceship, I still don't think it's that important like as a writer to sit down and be like, I'm going to write exactly this kind of thing because I mean, most of the most interesting stories are where it's in between. But I do think like the, the primary usefulness for talking about that is for readers to find things. Um, I don't know. Like I figured that literary fiction is for like people who did MFAs to find things. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> literary, literary fiction is a genre. I mean, it is a defined genre with a defined set of ethics. And a particular form of color. And I think I'm completely fine with that when I write literary fiction. I also write science fiction, historical fiction, and spy films. I mean, they're useful as labels, but the labels are for the bookshops, and the labels are for book clubs, and they're for readers. And I think that's their only use. They have no use for writers. And I'm not sure if you read widely or you read, you know across a broad spectrum, but you really notice which label has been put on that book, any more than you notice which publisher or which colophon is on the sign. But also genres. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I think the, um, the genre of lead isn't just sci-fi, fantasy versus realism. Like, you have things like um, there's a book by Oma Katsu called The Hunger, which is a historical fiction novel about the Donner Party that's a horror novel. And it tends to be shelved with horror, not with historical fiction, but it's, you know, it's one of these things where it's like, these are not the genres that people normally argue about, but I think historical fiction is one of those that bleeds into everything. There's historical mysteries, there's historical romances, there's, you know, so it's not just between sci-fi and fantasy, it happens everywhere. I think that what I said about the writer and the reader uh, is also true here that um, when I'm writing, I'm not thinking about uh, what kind of, like in, in which category would this book belong. I really don't do that. So th that will come afterwards. In fact, when, when I finished Rocket, when Rocket came out and somebody said, ah, oh, it's science fiction, I, I said immediately, no, it isn't. And it, I, think, I, I think it's only today that I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, maybe <laughs> it is, <laughs> sort of. But, but it's not just, uh, right. yeah, I know, it's speculative fiction, but it can be, um, as we said, it can be echo fiction, speculative fiction, there's, uh, there are science, science sci-fi elements. But for me, it's more than that. I mean, th there are so many different layers, and uh, the layering for me is the most important aspect of uh, the whole structure of, of that novel. Um, there, there's also another thing I, I want to talk about, is this, uh, it, sometimes it's not just a book being labeled, but an author being labeled, and this is, this is dangerous, I feel. Um, the, the first books that I wrote with Simon were, hello Simon, <laughs> <laughs> are, um, they were children's, ch uh, children fantasy novels, so immediately I was, um, hailed as uh, a fantasy writer. And then I wrote uh, Magna Mater, which was for young adults. So I was, ah, uh, Laran is, uh, she is the writer for young adults. And I didn't like that because it's like, you're expected to write that kind of novel again. And if you don't, 
and this is uh, one criticism, not criticism, but one feedback that I got. Uh, why aren't you writing? The, why did you write Rocket? It's not the same as the, the Fidin trilogy. I know. I don't want. I, I, I yeah. don't want to repeat myself. So uh, the, it's not just books being labeled, but also writers, and that is uh, scary for me. There's a danger of being typecast into yeah. a particular genre. So I uh, I deal with that by making sure that every everything I every novel I write is completely different from the previous one. <laughs> so far, I have been. Which is a great skill if you can pull it off. <laughs> I, mean, I can't, so I have to write under a number, a number of different names that are not really disguises since I write as Jack Grimwood, John Courtney Grimwood, and Jonathan Grimwood. So it's not <laughs> such a cool <laughs> ass name, you have to keep it. Not much of a disguise, but it does tell people what it is and it does tell people where it goes. So. But I would much rather have simply written them all under one name. So I'm yeah, it's a, a lot of it's about like expectation and um, whether you want to challenge the reader or whether you know a reader walks into a bookshop and are they going to take a chance or I think publishing houses can get comfortable and say well no well, we're going to you know middle grade books for a certain age have a kid on the cover and a monster in the back or whatever and I think the best stuff comes from uh, knowing what the reader is expecting and like changing it like you know like going from slow to fast zombies you know, it's just such a, you're expecting them to shuffle towards you, then suddenly they're a sprinter, and you're like, oh no, <laughs> we should have been training. And like, I, <laughs> I love that, um, that genre, like, as you're saying, that genre bleed, where um, I was going to say, it's, it's a bit, it's horrible to say now, because you mentioned the genre party, but genre is a buffet. Um, <laughs> uh, and I really wanted to bring horror into, um, horror into a middle grade book, because uh, I think, I don't know, I was, like, I, was, I was told early on, you know, you shouldn't make kids' books too scary, and I think we forget that kids are scary, kids are scared all the time. Like, when you're a kid, you think you're going to get eaten, you know, like, all the time. And so I wanted to bring in some of that. I think the things that stand, like, like Game of Thrones is a, um, the books are fantasy, and they're high fantasy, but they're also a political, they're Sopranos with swords, you know, it's a political thriller as well. And I just love, yeah, I love the genre, page. I love the new genres, mini genres created within that. I also feel that sometimes there's a sort of aura of snobbism with regards like, okay, well, uh, why don't you write a sort of a uh, proper literary book instead of sci-fi? And this also translates to the reason, recent sort of controversy when Martin Scorsese said that the Marvel Cinematic Universe films are not cinema, just theme park rides. <laughs> and, um, even Jules Verne was never accepted into the Académie Française, and um, there's no doubt whatsoever that 20,000 leagues under the sea is a literary. I, I mean, I think there's still elements of that, but I also think it's very silly because, like, the Marvel movies made more money than anybody can even imagine. It's like the nerds have won, so why are we still fighting about it? Like. You can make a movie that is science fiction or an extremely popular TV show with a huge budget that is fantasy, and there's books across all genres on bestseller lists, so, and again, also on awards lists. It's like people still try to like fight that battle, but I feel like they're fighting with like toy swords. It just doesn't matter anymore from the point of view of like a writer. Like You don't have to sit down and be like, I'm going to write. A great literary novel, and that will be the only way I'll get noticed. Maybe people still think that, but I don't. I don't think it really works that way anymore. Um, I will say that the most, like, more. And maybe this is just because most of the like people I know and interact with are sci-fi, fantasy, horror, like fans. But I've actually noticed that snobbishness more when you say you're writing a children's book. Um, they'll be like, "Oh, are you going to write a real book?" Like, it is a real book. In fact, it's longer than my adult book. <laughs> um, but I think there's still a little bit of that, like, oh, you wrote a silly little kid's book. And I'm finally you're writing real books. And, but I, don't, I don't know. That's just... Yeah, that I is think. kind of silly in the extreme because I know, to me, finding the right balance and writing the children is very, very hard to achieve without sort of 
dumbing down the rising call, going over the making it too difficult. I think, yeah, I think kids actually like books that are a little bit difficult because they like to feel like they're carrying a tome around and like mm -hmm. digging into it. And kids are voracious readers, the ones who love to read. So like, you can get away with a lot more than adults think that they should be handling it. <laughs> but that's. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, I like children aren't, children aren't stupid, they're just new. You know, like we as adults have this, um, have a bank of experiences built up. And when we as adults read a book about a breakup, we do think about the breakup of the book, but we also kind of think about our first breakup. And we think about all of the experiences we've had that somehow taught to this. Whereas when you're writing for a younger person, they don't have that. You need immediately need to be more impressive and more, you're going to be that kid's maybe first Imagine being someone's first experience of a vampire, you know, imagine being their first, the first time they've encountered that legend, you have to be good. And like, also kids don't care the way that adults do about stuff. When I do events with adults, they all sit there extremely politely and they're all very nice. And even if I'm talking complete nonsense, you're all adults, so you're going to be polite. Whereas a kid will go, ah, and walk out and start banging their head off a table. Like... Any adult author who's like, oh, I must try writing a kid's book, it must be really easy. I'm like, do a kid's event. Absolutely. Like, sit down for an hour. Like, I'm going to read you for 20 minutes and watch the kids rush the stage <laughs> to make you stop. I did a bookstore reading with some other authors with a group of kids who were at a writing camp that was for kids who love books and writing. And a couple of them just laid down in front in the middle of the bookstore and went to sleep in the event. So yeah, you have to, like you're never not aware of the effect on your reader when you're writing for kids. Yeah. But not in a bad way. I actually think it's, it's a awesome. delight. It's so much fun. Um, I, 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 to answer your question about uh, genre fiction and literary fiction, I don't really think about that. So. I think it, it uh, again, it's uh, beyond my control whether uh, my work is considered as literary or uh, as an inferior or of the same level as literary works. It, I think that comes afterwards and I'm, I'm not concerned with that while I'm writing. So it's, it's a redundant question really, I think. I don't think we should be discussing it. Um, I know that there were some there was some controversy uh, last year with um, uh, three three novels being uh, three sci-fi novels uh, being finalists for the National Book Prize, which shouldn't have been. And three of them. Were, <laughs> so. Although they were sci-fi, mm -hmm. which is kind of something unheard of within the open literary the three of them are very different yeah. from each other, so which, no question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the best thing to do is, as writers, we shouldn't e be even discussing it. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's irrelevant. Uh, so, yeah, as you said, it, it, a work has to be good, and then it's whatever it is. After all, we're talking about fiction, and we're not talking about textbooks or history books. We're talking about fiction, so fiction could be anything. I wanted to ask uh, Dave about, um, this kind of goes back to the world the main idea. How was it to write in the Doctor Who oh, universe? Uh, so um, it was really, really lovely. I got a phone call a year ago uh, from my agent saying, uh, do you like Doctor Who? And I was like, Yes, I love it. Why? And she's like, would you like to write a Doctor Who book? And I was like, uh, yes. Um, and she's like, can you write it in three months? And I immediately stopped being excited. And was like, I, yes, I can. And she was like, but can you really? And I was like, tell them I said I can. And we'll find out if I can't. Um, but it was really, it was lovely. It's scary because, you know, with my own books, I just have to worry about being good or bad. Whereas with something that has been around for 58 or 59 years, you can be wrong, like you can get it wrong. Like, and a lot of people will tell you, you were wrong. Um, but luckily, uh, the response has been really, really lovely. Um, I, it's weird, because you have to like navigate everything that's already out there. Um, and there were certain things I wasn't allowed to do, um, and certain things that 
they like pulled me up on tiny little I, my cyberman has a barcode for a name and they were like oh now did we did, do we have a name for them and I was like in the 70s you called one Crag they're like okay change it and I was like okay fine um, so little small tiny things but um, it was a huge honour it was a lot of fun and it's seeing your name beside that logo as a big nerd is really nice <laughs> yeah. Lauren, uh, how was it sort of to write within the genre, which is, okay, now we're going back again, I know you hate it, I know it's sort of finding a voice within the local literary scene which hasn't been really explored before. So the question is how, how was it, how yeah. was it? I don't know. I never, I never really thought about it uh, in the sense that um, this is difficult for me to, to to answer because I don't really care much about. Uh, I I'm not. I don't think about uh, the way that I am affecting the literary scene in any way. I just write. I, I write the stories that I'm, I'm, I'm dreaming about. Some stories have been living with me for many, many years. Um, and then if they're good, they're good. And if they're not, they're not. So uh, I, w I don't think I'm ever confronted with this. I do get a response from, from readers, maybe telling me, oh, these, these, uh, uh, this work uh, did not exist, this kind of... Uh, this genre, for example, did not exist before in Maltese. Um, I, but I don't, I don't do it on purpose. So I'm, I'm not really uh, trying to manufacture this. It is true that uh, with the first, with, with the trilogy, with the fantasy, fantasy trilogy, um, Simon and I, we knew that there was something missing for sure because we grew up with uh, uh, a limited number of Maltese books, which we. There is there is a there is a void or there is a, an empty uh, space there which could be filled and these uh, this, these books were the kind of books that we were reading in English so yes uh, maybe there yes we were really excited to uh, embark on this huge project of writing a fantasy not a trilogy not even not it's not just one book but a trilogy. Um, in Maltese, and the story is happening in Malta. Um, at the time, where at, at the time uh, there was this um, Harry Potter craze, so sudden, so suddenly um, we were projected as sort of the equivalent of. Uh, it's, it's not something we were trying to do, but it it, it took that shape. Yes, for sure. Um, but after that, I don't think I. I mean, the the, the second the set, second project was for young adults, and there too there is uh, maybe not now anymore, but there too there is uh, an empty space perhaps. But I, I, I I'm not trying to. Uh, it's not stock manufacture, basically, that's it. So I don't think about it like... Um, when I wrote Rocket, my, the, thing that, the only thing that I knew is that I wanted to write a novel that is not for children and not for young adults. Um, mainly because I wanted to test myself. I was, I was asking myself, like, can I do it? Am I able to? Um, and I was really, I was afraid that the answer would be no. So I, I said, okay, I really have to work hard. Like, how do you write a novel for readers that are not children and that are not young adults? Um, so it's, it's something completely different. So it was more of a challenge for me. And when I finished Rocket and when Rocket came out, um, I set myself a completely different challenge, which was, can I write something that is completely, that is the complete opposite of Rocket? Can, it, can I write stories that are very, very short, um, and that it would take me not five years to write, but one month? And 
this last this last novel, which is not science fiction, uh, and it came out this morning, um, <laughs> is, is the result of that. It, so it, I write because I set myself challenges. So I am not thinking about the literary scene. I am not thinking about uh, what is happening. What is uh, is there a space for me? I no. It's just self um, self inflicted <laughs> challenges. <laughs> so, is it time for questions from the audience? Yes. Yep. Uh, anyone would like to ask a question to the others here? Feel free. Yes. Uh, Dr. Hassan? Uh, uh, yeah, this, this uh, issue you, you spoke about, um, genre, I mean, you, you, the whole session is presented as, as a genre session, fantasy and sci-fi literature, so it's very inevitable that, that the point about um, writing a genre should come up. Um, I, I don't feel, perhaps as a reader, fine, not as a writer, but um, don't you think that knowing that you're writing science fiction or knowing that you're writing fantasy does give you certain structures and certain reader expectations that you can go with or go against, like you said, you're a fast zombie, whatever. That's actually a structure you're writing with. I don't think it's irrelevant. And okay, so you can mix genres, you can add, but there is such a thing as the recognition of a genre. It's not, it's not a, a vague notion. It, it is or just a labelling exercise. It's actually recognising stuff, uh, patterns and structures and expectations. And um, I think literary fiction is just another genre. I mean, it's not like the superior genre. It's just another genre writing to different expectations where the language stands out perhaps more than the action. Perhaps that's one of its features. Um, but I don't think the idea of genre is irrelevant. I think I don't, I don't readers think it's and writers work with this. And, no, I agree with you. It's um, I think there are expectations in there, and I also don't think that's a bad thing. I don't no, like that, we're sort of you know talking about the like little spaces between the obvious, but like I've written a book that is a hard science fiction book. Like, I wouldn't classify it as anything else, which is fine. That's what I wanted to write. That was fine. Um, but I also think that um, when people talk about genre, they tend to talk about like the rules of science fiction, the rules of fantasy, but they don't talk about the rules of literary fiction. Or like the blindingly obvious, like the rules of mystery fiction. You expect that you're gonna solve the mystery at the end. <laughs> like, and that's, um, like it is a framework that you hang your story on. And I think it can be useful and fun, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and I think, like you mentioned, you don't write, you, you notice that, um, didn't write to like fill a particular space, but like I know writers who have specifically written novels. Like I have a friend who wrote a um, very like trope-filled high fantasy where the princess falls in love with another princess rather than the prince yeah. because when she was growing up as a young lesbian, that story was missing in her life. And I think she was like, I'm gonna embrace all of those tropes that I saw in all those Disney movies and I'm gonna make it for girls who love girls. And I think that's brilliant. I think that's fine. And it, when you do that with love for what you're writing and love for the things that you read as a child or as an adult and you know, things that you love to read, I think in that case, you know, the fact that it's labeled as a genre that you sit, sat down to write it, you're happy to market it, that is not a bad thing. Um, but I do think when you get, when people who are not specifically writing one way or the other, or are exploring the spaces between get, you know, shunted off one way or the other because everyone feels like it has to be labeled, even if the categories are not, you know, there's a lot of overlap, that's when you run into problems. Which I think is, we were talking, like, I feel like most of what we've been talking about is the spaces, like, in between where, like, like we don't have a good term for near future books that don't really deal a lot with science fictional tropes. Like, 
what do you do if it's not a pure dystopia and it's not a science fiction, but it's a hundred years? You know, it's we don't have a good term for that, so it gets called science fiction, it gets called eco fiction, it gets called you know whatever. But even though it's just a kind of story that exists in many genres, and the, I, I, I do think it's a, the structure is relevant. Um, what is not relevant is whether it's a it's a more inferior or superior. Oh, yeah, That's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for me, as a reader and as a writer, what is in what I find very exciting uh, is um, to read a book and also to write a book that is that starts in one structure and at some point leaps in to another structure. That is uh, the ideal for me. So I love reading those books and I love writing them. that kind of book. So. And I think the structures I think the structures are so well known for all genres now that the writers automatically want to break with the structure at some point and the readers have begun to expect you mm-hmm. to play with the structure as well. Yeah, and I think that like um, we talk a lot about like you know you need to know the rules to break them, but I think as well you have to like love the rules to break them. So my favorite author is Terry Pratchett, and even though he relentlessly mocks fantasy tropes, it's clear he does it because he loves it, and because if you if you can't mock something you love, then what's the what's the point? Like it's done with I think you know there's a big thing with satire and punching down as opposed to punching up, and like um, I, it's when I gently mock you know, horror tropes, or there's a line in the second book when my main character gets kidnapped by the villains, and they're like, you know, we're going to do this and this. He's like, you're not going to tell me about a prophecy, are you? And it's because I, I love things like Harry Potter or Chosen One Fiction, but I'm also going to rip the piss out of it because some of it's ridiculous. Because um, I like it, that's why. Um, oh yeah, I'm not sure I can form it as a question, so I'll just say what do you think and then say what I wanted to say, which is I find a lot of uh, sort of fantasy snobbery within the readers and you say people expect break, yes, some people do and I enjoy it, but I find there are also these very vocal, very stick in the mud fantasy readers who have apparently never read outside the genre so that when you have something that's a little bit outside, um, maybe a little bit more literary fiction, it has a bit more experimental language, for example, then it either makes, like it's either the greatest thing ever or the worst thing ever because it breaks with this expectation. And I'm just thinking as to, I think it's a pity when people get stuck in one genre as readers, whether it's fantasy or western or whatever. Um, so what's your thoughts on that, I guess, is my question. Well, I actually agree that there's a lot of um, like insularity in sci-fi and fantasy when people are like, oh, that's different. We don't like that. But I also think that is a um, one of the problems of like the way the categories are sort of deployed is primarily marketing terms, and so there's that's where this expectation that um, the other person asked the question was saying is that you know if somebody goes in, people are like, this is the great fantasy, this is fantasy, 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 and then it doesn't have that structure. People are like, but you told me it was going to be this thing, and it's that thing. Mm-hmm. So that's why I think. Um, just the way we talk about stories, we need a lot more leeway in how we describe them. Because I actually, there is absolutely snobbery in the fantasy and sci-fi world. Um, probably every genre, I mean, where it's like, oh, that person is trying to be literary, or that person is trying to be experimental, or a lot of it is, that person is trying to be really politically correct. Look at all this diversity that they're shoving in there. It's been a huge thing in the American sci-fi community, probably elsewhere, but most mostly it's asshole Americans. <laughs> People being like, how dare you change the tropes that we're used to? And I mean, I think this is where it comes in. It's like, you, yes, people are going to complain about it, but you just got to do it anyway. <laughs> Write your experimental, you know, slipstream, uncategorizable thing that like doesn't play by the rules that the people who are 
pretend to be making the rules. I don't actually get to make the rules because there are no actual rules. <laughs> so, I mean, there are, but you don't have to follow them. You're talking as an outsider with a big stick. Being yeah. like, you know, oh, better be elves. <laughs> Okay, so my question is more to you guys as um, writers. Um, what current fiction out there are you looking forward to? I think all universes like the next book we get to finish. <laughs> 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 Uh, I'm really excited to read um, Carmen Maria Machado's memoir, which we just found is out now. Did you? Soon. I've seen reviews for it. I don't know. If I'm very excited to read to read that because her short story collection is off the wall good. Also, um, Sarah Ga Gailey, G A I L E Y, Sarah Gailey or Gailey has a new novel coming out as well, which is um, she has all these um amazing speculative fiction short stories on uh, on tour that you can pretty much read for free or on our website, which is a book coming out as well. I'm very excited for it. Does it have to be within genre? No. Yeah. Okay, Alif Shafek's new novel, which is, I'm told, absolutely stunning in the city I'm waiting for me when I get back, which is set in the moments of someone dying and as the minutes tick off, her life is replayed through minute by minute by minute. I think there's a, fi there's a finite time the brain takes to die, and in that process, she relives her entire life. It's had amazing reviews, and I'm pretty really happy. <laughs> Not really anything specific, but like most of the reading I do for fun tends to be like crime, thriller, <laughs> fiction, not sci-fi and fantasy. Um, and I, have just loved and been excited about this like huge explosion of women crime thriller writers writing female point of view crime thriller stories in a genre that didn't have a lot of that, you know, sort of historically, just because it's, um, I find them so much more like thrilling. <laughs> it's, you know, things that women are afraid of and like the awareness of like a woman's place in like, crime and violence and law enforcement and all that stuff. So I read that voraciously and I'm always looking for new writers, new series. Just I love that there's so many of them now because there's quite a lot now. I couldn't think of uh, a novel because there are so many books waiting for me to, to be read. But um, recently I've been toying with the idea of Rereading re Margaret Edward. I have to admit, I hated her 20 years <laughs> ago, I, I, and I, I think that maybe I should read her again. Maybe I, I misread, and so I think I'll be reading Margaret Edward again and, and her new sequel. Hi, um, Lauren, I loved what you said about uh, challenging yourself and writing in that way. Uh, but I wonder, in the current age of franchises and universes, and, and the, do you find that uh, you have pressure, whether externally or internally, from yourself when you're creating characters and worlds? Uh, do you think does this have longevity? Uh, does this have licensing uh, potential? Does this have adaptation potential? How do you think of your fiction in relation to possibly further adaptations? And do you even think it's important or inevitable in this current environment? No, I don't. Um, I would love to have my uh, novels uh, taken up, uh, adapted as movies, yes, and, or whatever, something else, so that I, I wouldn't like it, but I'm, I'm not concerned with that. I really focus on writing the book, creating the characters, writing the book, and that's where it stops. Then the rest is not up to me. 
if something else happens, it will be from by someone else. The only thing I I am particularly interested in is translation, not to translate myself, to to have my work translated into another language, not Modi. So that that is as far as I I would go. Yes, yeah, some books do need to be translated, um, especially since Modi is yeah. uh, such a lim limited language in terms of speakers. Um, thank you. Uh, does anyone else have a different take, or um, do you all agree with her? Just I, curious. I agree with her, and just a little bit secret about publishing is that if you're not a huge breakout success, then people don't care what you write next. <laughs> um, you can try different things because they're not pushing you to do more of that, do more of that. That pressure absolutely does exist. Not for people whose first books don't sell well, so. <laughs> I think it's I think it's probably how many books can you bear to write with that particular character. I mean, thinking of Conan Doyle killing off Sherlock Holmes and having to bring Sherlock Holmes back and in rank him, basically retiring Grievous, his you know detective, and then having to bring him back for the crime novels. I think there is an element of how long can you make this last. And how long should you make this last? And I tend to think that the, those pressures are opposite to commercial pressures. Yeah, I, I think that I agree. Like stories have a definitive length. Like um, with Nights, I always knew I was writing a trilogy, and I wouldn't have. It would have. I hate. I hate series that have an elbow in them, where you're just kind of like, oh yeah, and then it just goes on and on and on, and you're like, this 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 was supposed to be three books. Uh, cough lost, um, but um, but I do, and I, I I I enjoy writing and what I like. So when I when I'm first working on my books, I play them as movies in my head first. It's how I work out my my action scenes and my my pacing. And so when um, with the this, so there's we're currently trying to get it off the ground as a TV show, and there is. I've gone into it being very excited to see a sort of a, a vertical visual version of this and um, but you have to separate yourself from it as well because um, there are so many horror stories of adapt adaptations being different and the, say, the way I characterise it in my head is you'll have two if Nights ever gets made as a TV show there'll be two versions so if things get changed you can't be mad at me because <laughs> it's not you don't have the writer is not the most important person then when like you you sell you you might try and retain some rights but i think there's maybe two or three writers in the entire world who are actually able to tell their adaptations how exactly it would go and it is terrifying but so you just have to view it as a splitting of the of the amoeba as opposed to the one singular version um i do I do like my work speaking to each other. I do, so like I read a lot of Stephen King when I was younger, and like before, you know, Marvel and the cinematic universe and all that. I mean, Stephen King's work exists kind of in conversation with each other. And if any of you want, if any of you are big Stephen King fans, this is a deep dive. There's an Irish podcast called Juvenalia, and there is a two-hour-long episode by a publisher called Lisa Cohen where she talks about Stephen King and how it's all connected. It's super fascinating. Um, but she's also really good at not talking about it. She loves Stephen King, but is not reverent towards Stephen King. So when the presenter is like, what about that book? He's like, well, he was being a prick in that book. So, you know, like, <laughs> so he can talk about oh, it and stuff. Spending 10 years on cocaine. Does not <laughs> a lot of he doesn't remember <laughs> writing Cujo. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't remember reading it. But... But I, I like putting Easter eggs in my work that will speak things. But the second that takes precedence over actual plot is the second you are alienating any new reader to your work. So, and there can be, it can be addictive and you can get really into like putting a little thing there for like one person to get, but your focus has to be on the story you're telling. You can wait for the other stories, but you have to focus. I have a um, little bit of a different question. Um, what one advice would you give to someone who would like to start writing? 
you said already a lot of things, but uh, knowing from your already big experience, just one of those. Um, the one thing that really helped me after years of like fussing around, not really getting anything, was that um, you can write a shitty first draft. It can be the worst thing ever as long as you finish it. And then you can make it good after that. But that, like, getting to the point where I spent years and years getting to the point where I stopped because I was like, oh, it's, it's not going to be good now. It's, you know, agonizing over it, revising, 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 never finishing anything. But when that sunk in, the idea of a shitty first draft, that was the thing that clicked. I was like, it can suck. Nobody has to see it in this form. I can finish it. So that's what I would, the most important advice I've ever gotten. <laughs> yeah, I mean, read, read a lot. I mean, obviously, read as, read as much as you can. And then start writing, and don't stop until you've finished. I mean, mm -hmm. That's absolutely critical. Don't flinch. Don't go back. Don't edit what you've written. Just keep going. Even if you've killed a character and you need that character later, it doesn't matter. You can send that out. And then, I'm still thinking. Um, I just she like took my advice. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to agree with you. Um, if, if momentum is so important, and writing a first draft even when you realize that you know this doesn't work if you go backwards you have gone backwards whereas you need to be going forwards leave yourself a little microsoft word comment or a post-it that says next time around i'll fix this but once you get to the end you will have spent so much time with those characters you'll know them an awful lot better you'll have finished the first draft and that like jump to your confidence is massive and like also you'll have like Maybe you'll have gotten 30% of the book right, which means when you go back in second draft, you can kind of ignore that 30% and focus on the other 70. You have, maybe you have been writing for two years, but you've been reading books your entire life. So when you come to the second draft, that reader part of your brain kicks in and you can say, you can now solve the book like, a, like an equation because you've you know with your with your reader brain okay this needs to be slightly scarier okay i can fix that problem uh, which is so much easier than a blank page it's just nothing you know when it's on it when it's a draft you can solve that draft for x when it's when you haven't written anything you haven't written anything <laughs> there is there is no right way of writing a book so the process is something that you have to discover for yourself and i think the first part of the, this whole process is to find out what kind of writer you are, how, um, um, how, how can you, um, what, or rather, how will you write it, where will you write it, uh, finding the time and the space uh, to do this writing and then organize yourself in such a way as to finish it you have said so it's something that uh, you you discover and probably um, I this I something that I discovered is that uh, the writing of every single one of my books has the process has been different every time so completely different so it's not just about discovering of uh, the discovering what kind of writer you are but what kind of writer you are for that particular yes. book depending on the, the, the period in your life that you're writing it in and where, you, where you're living, what, what you're doing at that time. So you need to spend time to think about all this. Not too much. You have to start writing. But <laughs> and so I just... Have a, I've always been curious about this actually. When writers write about characters and books and have to create a conversation between two people, where do you draw that information from? I mean, do you imagine yourselves in that situation or do you observe a lot of conversation between people to know how someone's going to react? Where do you get it from? I eavesdrop on everyone <laughs> all the time. <laughs> going to a cafe and just listening to people talk around you is like, it's so, like, such a rich source of just, like, you know, 
because we're writing dialogue. Like dialogue isn't exactly the way people talk. People talk in fits and starts and you know make mistakes and say all this stuff. And you want to reflect a little bit of that naturalistic stuff in dialogue, but also you want it to move the story along. Whereas most talking in life doesn't move the story along. Um, but I yeah, I listen to people all the time and just pay attention to their quirks and the things that they talk about. And one um, particular example, which hasn't made it into a story yet, but I was, you know, one of my, a friend of mine texted me, she's like, I'm at the cafe writing. And this woman, these two women, like, you know, sort of like rich soccer mom women come in and they start talking about their friend, the psychic, who, is putting a hex on one of them. This whole conversation <laughs> spilled out of like the least likely place you would expect it from the least likely people you would expect it. Like that sort of thing. It's like, where does this come from? And they're just sitting there talking about putting a hex on their friend. And um, that's the sort of thing that you overhear that just makes you think like, OK, people aren't always just sharing information with each other, which I think is the trap that dialogue often falls into, is people just, you know, explaining things to each other so the reader can get them. It can be weird and unexpected, too. Yeah, my, my characters have to be really credible, even if they are from outer space. So I, I think I do the same thing. Like, uh, I'm, I'm, I have real people in mind when I'm when I'm writing. Like, I know we, 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 we do say that no um, character is based on real life person, but uh, actually they, they are all of them <laughs> in some way or another. So yeah, so they have to be credible, not just in their actions, but in, in the way they speak to each other, in the in the way they express. I think the, the, the longest time I spend uh, in, in uh, mapping out the whole, the whole book is on the characters. On, I, I have to know everything about the characters. And 90% of that information doesn't even come out in the novel itself, but I know it. And that is why. Um, I can believe, and I think that my readers do believe uh, that the, the character is credible, and the dialogue is credible. That doesn't sound, so, you know, rigid or unbelievable. Um, Thank you all for coming, and thanks to the others for being here. Thank you. The good news is there's this the is that there's wine outside. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Have this from us. <laughs>